It was the spring of 09. I didn't even have the most budget of laptops until I was about 13. My gaming as a child was confined to last gen consoles like the Nintendo 64 and an old CRT monitor. Granted, Nintendo 64 games are awesome to this day, but there was something different about sitting behind my brother as he played on his desktop. I had my introduction to a few PC games in that manner. Age of Empires, Command and Conquer, and Minecraft, and Total War. Lined up on a shelf above his monitor was every Total War game from the first medieval. Remember when physical copies were a thing? And on that day, he was playing Empire Total War. I had never seen a game quite like it before. Here you had hundreds, thousands of individually animated soldiers marching and fighting in organized lines, in battlefields spanning the Americas, Europe, and India. And I thought Age of Empires was impressive with its 200 population cap. The next time he was away and I had a chance to use his computer, I fired up Empire Total War and took in the glory of a game whose scale I never once fathomed to be possible. And that was my introduction to Total War. As buggy and difficult to run as Empire was, it led to my discovery of Medieval 2 and its accompanying Third Age mod, and later on Shogun 2 when that released in 2011. And I do know that many people had a similar introduction to the Total War series, being awestruck by the sheer scale of the battles, their amazement increasing when they saw the gameplay living up to the first impressions. There's two main reasons behind my putting this video together. To bring some attention to just how cutting edge the production values were in Total War, and secondly, to showcase how they've been steadily eroded over the years. The depiction of guns in a given Total War game is a great way of gauging the design direction. Because it's far from just an aesthetic concern, visual and sound effects in games, and in any form of media, serve a purpose beyond immersing the player. These cues provide some very useful information to you. The mark of a well-polished game is the seamless integration of these elements, to the point that you're being fed vital information without noticing it, without being distracted. Taking a bit of a detour from the Total War conversation, open world games frequently suffer from something I like to call UI overload. The developers seem to have gone out of their way to clutter the screen with markers, feeding you information in a very abstract manner, a manner that is distracting and often insulting to the player's agency and intelligence. It's what separates a game like Assassin's Creed from Zelda Breath of the Wild. The former conveys information in an intrusive manner, Whereas the latter conveys most of it in an organic manner. You don't need an icon marking an enemy camp. The campfire will give it away, or the elevated guard posts. So how does this relate to the depiction of firearms in Total War? You've already heard how muffled the guns in Warhammer are. The only depiction of firearms in Total War after Fall of the Samurai's line infantry warfare, by the way.
attack! In a typical battle scenario where I'm zipping the camera across the map at a bird's eye view, with a variety of sound sources competing for my attention, I frequently have to end up glancing down at the unit cards to see if my guns are firing. I have to do this to compensate for the lack of auditory information. In a 10 or 20 unit battle where my attention is divided across multiple actions, having to constantly monitor the interface is annoying at best, and detrimental to my performance at worst. A similar point can be made on the visual plane. Guns in Warhammer have such weak muzzle flash, and the smoke effect dissipates so quickly that you will again be finding the need to monitor the interface to see if they're doing their job. And the crowning jewel of corner cutting. They don't even have reload animations. Other people have pointed this out, but you can still find a counter argument stating that it just doesn't matter. So why does it matter? Well, generally speaking, when a gun unit is under my command, guns firing equals good, guns not firing equals bad, and I want to know why. A musketeer may not be firing for a few reasons. Fire at Willows off, fire at Willows on but they can't see the target, or they're out of ammo, or they're stuck in a melee, or the target is not in range, or they're reloading, and probably some more as well. You can probably see how much harder it is to micromanage gun infantry when you remove the reload animation. It becomes harder to tell why they aren't firing when I think they should be. In a heated battle where time is precious, I really do not want and should not be forced to ponder these details instead of actually playing the game. And given how finicky gunpowder infantry have been in Total War, firing at targets behind obstructions, simply refusing to fire because, I don't know, the sun isn't in the right spot, it really does help to have this animation. And that's just the depiction of firearms in Total War. I brought them up as the first example of the decline in the series production values because it showcases how the loss of such elements is not only detrimental to immersion, but can actively harm your performance. That's gonna be the big one. We got Yari Ashigaru Garrison. Here comes defense in depth. So I'm gonna have another unit of Yari Ashigaru right behind that one. There's something to be said about how different Total War games utilize color to convey information to varying degrees of success. Ever notice how in Fall of the Samurai, modern units are clothed in blue on their unit cards while traditional units are clothed in red? It's more than just an artistic choice. Whether you realize it or not, the red of the Shogatai is telling you that you are going to suffer if you allow them to engage you in a melee. Likewise, being faced with an army of soldiers dressed in blue is a warning to think very carefully about closing that final distance. It takes just a second of looking at these unit cards to get a reasonably accurate picture of the battle you'll be fighting. In Medieval 2, you could get a general idea of the sturdiness of a given unit by looking at the amount of armor in its unit card depiction. You would always be sure that a unit of dismounted feudal knights was going to outperform and outlast a unit of spear militia in the majority of situations. The encyclopedia wasn't a crutch. It wasn't some homework that you'd have to chore your way through instead of actually engaging with the game. It was there for those interested in fine-tuning their tactics, extracting every last bit of performance from their units. Or in my case, I just wanted to read the descriptions. Also, one detail I like about Medieval 2 is that all of the banners are, are distinct depending on the unit type. So, like, it's so interesting seeing ranged with triangles and then uh, vertical rectangles for, uh, for melee and then cavalry with a long banner. I, uh, I, this is such a neat detail. I actually, I really, really like that. It's, it, this is, this is a good UI that's not distracting. It's, it's very seamless. You don't have these ugly icons obstructing your vision and like covering your entire units and you're just looking at icons the whole fight. So it's shocking to load up Rome 2, released right after the highs of Fall of the Samurai, and be greeted with indistinguishable unit icons. Artistic? Sure. Functional? Hardly. There was no attempt to use color in the unit cards to convey information about a unit's properties, and there was no consistent logic to any of the unit poses. And it didn't help that Rome had more than a dozen melee infantry units, many of whom not only had annoyingly similar unit cards, but were also tough to distinguish from one another when rendered in the game itself. What adds to the confusion is the lack of differentiation in the density and shape of the units themselves. In Rome 1, peasants stood in a very loose formation that you would expect of men hired to fight with little to no formal training. 
Whether you were commanding or fighting them, there was no mistaking what you were looking at. Even in Fall of the Samurai, arguably the best entry in the entire series, I find it very odd that line infantry units do not have visible bayonets and have to mod them into the game. I spent a lot of time playing the game not realizing they had a minor anti-cavalry bonus because it was just very inconsistent. In Shogun 2 and Fall of the Samurai, you could have a decent idea of a unit's capabilities just by looking at its in-game model, looking at what weapon it had, looking at the amount of armor it had, whether it had a ranged weapon, whether it had any sidearms, you could have a decent idea of what that unit's strengths and weaknesses were. So it was baffling to see that line infantry in Fall of the Samurai didn't have bayonets. Other than that, Fall of the Samurai got a lot right. Line infantry stood in tightly packed lines, whereas Kachi units marched in a looser formation. You could tell the two units apart from a considerable distance, without access to their unit cards and without having to mouse over them. That leads us nicely into the visual feedback aspect of these games. Their general has fallen! A cutting blow! Visual feedback is another one of these design elements that's tough to appreciate until you play a game that lacks it. On that note, I'll take a moment to point out how annoying it has always been that lowering graphic settings leads to corpses disappearing after a short period of time. Lower quality settings are supposed to make a game easier to run, but not more difficult to engage with. This might sound like a weird point to bring up, but considering how hard these games have been to run, especially on contemporary hardware, I think it devalues the experience for a lot of people, as was the case for myself that I finally had saved up enough for a proper PC. Back from that tangent, cavalry charges. The cavalry charge dominates our perception of warfare until the late 19th century, and for good reason. Many of the most significant engagements were decided on the back of them. Given this, it's pretty damn important to depict this tactic with the proper impact and respect. Shogun 1 had a bit of trouble doing this given it was working with sprites, but once Total War moved to fully 3D with Rome 1, cavalry charges finally came into their own. Sadly, this was short-lived. Empire brought us the Warscape engine which has struggled the most with handling charges. Shogun 2 did a decent job improving them but it was still quite janky. Whatever progress was made there was undone with Rome 2's release. Even after some 20 patches that have allegedly fixed the game, cavalry charges are almost entirely lacking in visual impact. This can be chalked down to two things. The Warscape engines of difficulty with simulating charges and mass in general and the introduction of health bars that have been featured in every Total War since. The charge itself may not kill anyone, it might not even knock anyone over, but it is depleting health bars in the background. Sure, it's a game and numbers are going to be crunched in the background, yada yada. The issue arises when there's a disconnect between what you're seeing and what's actually happening. But is it really that big of a deal? Well, yes, absolutely. The visual feedback isn't important just for the aesthetic appeal. It also is conveying valuable information to you without relying on icons or an NPC stupidly pointing it out to you. It tells me that my charge was successful. Pretty important information given how micro-intensive cavalry are by nature. In a heated battle where I have to manage potentially 20 units or more, I do not want to have botched charges. 
And I do not want to spend time wondering if my charge even did anything. Even more curious is when in Warhammer 2 cavalry charges actually do seem to have a lot of visual impact. But then you pay attention and you realize all of the enemy models are just standing up and very few actually died in the charge. This is bad in its own way because while there is visual impact, the game is effectively deceiving you by making you think your cavalry did much more damage than they really did. Attack! We are broken! We have failed! The lack of visual feedback may not appear to be that big of an issue when looking at each case in isolation, but when you add all these different shortcomings together, it turns the experience into a micromanaging, micromonitoring mess where you spend more time trying to get a sense of what even is going on than you do actually optimizing your gameplay. To paint a clearer picture of how ridiculous the lack of visual impact in cavalry charges is, imagine a first person shooter where shots on target don't produce any blood, or where exploding grenades don't kick up any dirt or dust. What about clearly audible gunfire? It's quite important for seeking out engagements, and your own gunfire is just as liable to give away your presence as the same applies to your opponent. The game doesn't need to flash an enemy nearby icon on your screen since the information is organically conveyed to you. There's a reason anyone seriously competitive in first person shooters will shell out hundreds, if not thousands for a good headset. Yeah, yeah I know right? You shall not pass! <laughs> uh, God, I love how this feels like an actual war. <laughs> it is atmospheric. And there's no music at all. It's literally just... It's its literally the sound effects are the music. I love it. It's, it's kind of atmospheric. I really... I actually have to trace their shots. Like, I can't see where they are. I have to trace their shots and fire back in that direction. Like, that's the thing is... That... <clears throat> that's good. That's good game. Yeah, that's, that's good gameplay. Good gameplay. That is good game design. There are other cases of corner cutting in the more recent Total War games production values. Soldiers armed with crossbows can be seen lobbing balls at a high trajectory to hit units a few dozen meters away, which would lead you to think this would reduce the potency of a volley. After all, Crossbow bolts are typically fired at a velocity of 85 meters per second or higher, much greater than what gravity alone is capable of. But in Warhammer 2, the angle of fire itself has no effect on the damage dealt. The projectiles operate under rigid scripts that make a poor attempt at simulating physics. Medieval 2 also had crossbowmen firing in high arcs, which looked ridiculous, but it at least punished you by having projectile spread and reducing damage dealt. I also bring up how difficult settlements are to see in Three Kingdoms, where you need to rely on the obnoxious interface to tell where things are, rather than it being readily visible on the map itself. Rome 1, the first game to feature a 3D map, got this right in 2004 without breaking a sweat. And how formations look less and behave less like formations, where rather than having a tightly packed testudo that is nigh impervious from the front and above, Men just disinterestedly stand around holding their shields up, granting themselves complete invincibility in the face of missiles. Can't test that either, no one's gonna fire on us. I, I think this army is bugged out. If I, if I take a unit outside of... Oh, interesting. Interesting. So the AI has, has pitched, you know, a completely, like, frame-perfect, you know, reaction time and everything. Okay, I want to turn on guard mode over here and force them to march through. I want to see what happens. I, I want to see what happens the moment they the moment they make contact. Does the formation break apart? And they are just stuck here. So I see they solved the issue of the of the AI firing. Um, but uh, let me check something. Okay, let's check something. So it takes three seconds for this to form up. What is up with that terrain? Yeah, that terrain looks really, really off. Like it looks way too flat as in 
Not flat as in like the geography, but in terms of like lighting, this game looks. This game like looks weird. How how does this look better than than follow the samurai? Okay, it's just really weird. Like, there's no sense of depth to the image. It's kind of awkward. I'm gonna do something crazy over here. I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in uh, in this. Uh, I'm gonna try and I, and disperse this unit as much as possible. Let's try dispersing the men as much as possible. Okay. Look at how look at how dispersed these men are. Okay. Now the 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 the, the formation of the testudo doesn't matter where the men actually are. It's just a three second thing. Let's form it up. Three, two, one, go. And now we're completely immune. Completely immune. These guys are not completely immune. So even though there are clear gaps in the formation, like it's not properly shielded, the AI isn't firing on us, uh, probably because it's very hard difficulty. And even even if the... Uh, what's it called? Even if they're in loose formation... Shut up, oh my god. Well... Or how men can gain the benefits of a spear wall without wielding spears. And without properly closing ranks, something that Rome 1 got right in its depiction of the phalanx. And then we also got spear wall. Let's see how well this uh, spear wall performs. Okay. Do they properly close in on each other? I don't know. It seems like there's a bit too much of a gap in the formation. Like you wanna, you wanna make sure the men, the men are like closely huddled together. And are they? And are they uh, planting the spears into the ground? The, I, I know it's not, it's not, it's not entirely necessary to do that. But all right, star battle. So what does this give? Okay, minus 100% range block chance. So what? For whatever reason, for whatever reason, these guys who don't have shields or whatever, they when they go into this formation. They end up, which actually gives them a lower profile, by the way, like the guys in the front, especially they, they end up, they end up taking more damage to missiles and not less. It makes no sense at all. Like you, just 10% melee inv evasion. It's the same thing with melee evasion. Why would they have more melee evasion? If it, by melee evasion you mean parrying and dodging, but like they're so close together, you just hit somebody else. If like how how is that how does that even work? It doesn't make any sense. But then the the, the one thing that matters is plus 1900 charge resistance, and then I, again the same thing with the timing: three seconds to form up. So it doesn't matter what the actual shape of it is at that time; it's gonna the effects are gonna take place. I know that spears in, in Medieval 2 and in Shogun 2 would break apart. Like, if they. Like, having a Yachty Wall is not just an instant defense bonus. Like, the, the formation actually has to be in the shape of a formation and not scatterbrained. Units! Standard formation! Aye. Units! Phalanx formation! Aye. Aye. Ready! Ready. Ready. All of this is to say that the attention to detail that set Total War apart in the 2000s has been eroded. And this isn't just me going, well, back in my day. I've barely scratched the surface of this issue with the examples given in this video. When I load a game like Rome or Shogun 2, I'm struck by just how seamless everything is. In fact, the things that do stand out like a sore thumb are made more visible by everything else these games got right. I pointed out how line infantry and follow the samurai lack bayonets because the quality of the rest of the game, the passion that went into everything else, makes that one misstep more apparent. But when I boot up Three Kingdoms, I instead find myself fighting the very design itself. I get harassed by icons and stat sheets, 
because the visuals and sound design can't convey that information on their own. It doesn't matter if you give your Testudo a thousand movement orders that cause the formation to visually break apart. As long as you hit that button, they have 100% guaranteed protection. The discrepancy between all these elements conditions you into questioning everything you're looking at, and the very concept of formations, projectile physics, and so on. It is a complete failure to harness one of the greatest advantages of this medium, and that is the visual and sound aspects of these games' design. As I said before, most of these points are minor on their own. It's when you add them all together that you get a game that has placed multiple unnecessary barriers between you and your ability to optimize your gameplay. Real-time tactics games are some of the most time-sensitive out there. The visuals and sounds have to be designed in a way to convey as much useful information as possible in as little time as possible. I'll just come up with a saying as I write this script. Good games feed you information without you noticing. Bad ones feed it to you through UI overload. Or worse, they hide that information from you. As we come to the end of this video, there is another point I'd like to bring up. It's not directly related to the thesis of this video. This isn't so much a design flaw or a flaw in the artistic direction, more wasted potential. It has been 22 years since Shogun 1 released, and 22 years later we are still dealing with the same army and unit scales as we were back then. For a series that supposedly abandoned good gameplay for the rule of cool, as is claimed by many fans of the newer games, it's curious that we haven't seen any noticeable progress in the scale of battles. In fact, thanks to the dominance of single entity units in Warhammer, Three Kingdoms and Troy, your average battle boasts a smaller scale than what Shogun 1 could manage 22 years ago, not to mention everything else brought up in this video. Before we go, I'd like to draw attention to my Against All Odds series, showcasing some of the interesting large-scale battles in Shogun 2 and Fall of the Samurai. If you're struggling with the save in one of these games, then feel free to hop onto the Discord and share the file. And if you have any interesting multiplayer battle replays, I cover those too. A lot of work goes into making videos like these. Half of it is just sitting through painful loading screens. And if you would like to support them further, check out my Patreon where you can get access to exclusive stuff. Other than that, let me know what you guys think of Total War's abandonment of both style and substance for... Actually, I, I don't know what they gave up everything for. Sound off in the comments if you know any more examples of blatant corner cutting. It's not a choice. I have to keep this momentum going and just shatter break units one after the other. Uh... Our warrior monks are still doing well. Hey there guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're new to the channel, I do let's plays for strategy games like Total War, city builders like City Skylines and Frostpunk, open world games like Zelda, Breath of the Wild, and first person shooters like Battlefield 1 and Metro. You can hop onto Discord and join in on all the fun. And if you want to support the channel further, you can subscribe to my Patreon and gain access to exclusive videos. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye bye.